rabbis, what did they figure out about the Messiah? <clears throat> well, in the mysteries, the teacher takes the disciple into a room with old books, takes out the old books, the Talmud of the Bible. I mean, of, of, the, of the rabbis. Here's the thing. And by the way, the Talmud is, is the commentaries by the rabbis, which they consider at a higher level than even the scriptures. Which it's not. Which is Meshuggah. Which is Meshuggah. <laughs> but, but, hidden in their writings, in the book of, called Yoma, in that, mm -hmm. the rabbis recorded that all of a sudden strange signs and what supernatural things started happening in the temple of Jerusalem. And particularly, they said the doors of the temple opened by themselves. They would close it. They'd open by themselves. It says they rebuked the doors, but they opened by themselves. Like, like the You're way... You're saying the doors and... Uh, uh, the like, golden what, doors. What year did this happen? Well, here's the thing. They, they give the year and they, they say it happened 40, about 40 years before the destruction of the temple. 70 AD, the temple was destroyed, minus 40 equals just about 30 AD, the time of Messiah on the cross. And so when Messiah is on the cross, the rabbis are recording that all these supernatural cosmic changes took place in the temple. Hmm. I mean, and in fact, in one of the books called Sanhedrin, of all things, they actually put, they give the timing when Messiah had to come by, and it comes out to thir about 30 AD. It's all, this is in the rabbinic writings. There is nothing like this in history. It's actually proving Messiah beyond anything. I mean, it talks about the, the scarlet cord that, that stopped turning white in about 30 AD. Everything changed for the rabbis. Now, there was a cord that if it turned white, God accepted the, the sacrifice. The sacrifice of Yom Kippur. Yeah. And but all of a sudden, it, it stopped turning? All of a sudden, Yom Kippur, something cosmic happened to Yom Kippur. When? All right, about the time that Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua, died for our sins. How can we have all those coincidences and call them yeah, coincidences? Yeah, yeah, and it's there. <laughs> and when, you know, when you've got a hostile witness, that's the most powerful witness. I mean, there's nothing like this in history. But that's and there's much more the rabbis did. They didn't know what they were doing, by the way. So they, they had no idea that, that what they were proving. They were proving Jesus yeah. is the Messiah. Yeah, God, led the, God caused it to happen. Man, would there be more ancient rabbis raised yeah. up that understand the writings of the Talmud? Because then every Jew would have peace in their heart and then spread a message of peace to the world because the salvation is of the Jew. And then we'd have peace. Then the Messiah could come. How could the Messiah come if everyone wants to kill their neighbor? We have to have first peace in our heart. Then Messiah comes for world peace. Makes so much sense. You, you need a little help to get mixed up on that. <laughs> okay, uh, Jonathan, the most mysterious day mm. in the Bible. Mm. Okay, there is a day in the Bible that God appointed. It is the absolute, absolutely most mystery-filled day of anything. So mysterious, the rabbis don't even know what to do with it. They don't even know what to make of it. <laughs> it is called the gathering of the eighth day. Now, what's the thing? It's the very last appointed day that God gave in the entire holy calendar. What's the thing well, about well, eight? Well, 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 the eighth day? But last time I checked, there's only seven days in a week. Yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. But the thing is that that's the whole point. You know, seven, number of completion. That's that's yeah. it, it's completion. So if it's the end, so if seven's the end, what's eight? It's what happens after the end. It's what happens beyond numbers. It's the, it's the number that, it's the day that breaks the, the pattern. It's the day that goes beyond time and space. And all, it's a, you see, when you read the Bible, you go up to Revelation. Revelation, you got sevens and sevens, trumpets, seven, everything's seven. Until you get to the last two chapters, you have the eighth day, eternity, heaven. It's all about the mystery of heaven. But think about it too, Sid. That when, actually, well, here's this. What do they do on that eighth day? What they do is, it's a mystical, they roll up all the scrolls and rewind a new one. What, what does it say at the end? It says that everything in the heaven and earth will be rolled up. And then the, the scroll that they open up is, is Genesis. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. They, wrote, they, they open up another scroll, which is Joshua, which is about crossing the Jordan to the land beyond. That's the day of eternity. And not only that, when did Messiah rise? He, did, he rose on the first day of the week. But the first day of the week is also the eighth day of the week. Meaning the power of the eighth day is in, the, is in Messiah, is in the resurrection. To live beyond this world, live beyond our problems, live beyond your limitations. In fact, when do most believers worship? On the Sunday. Sunday's the eighth day. It's also that we are children of the eighth day. Huh. And I'm going to throw another thing in here. In Hebrew, in Hebrew, the word, what's the symbol of the spirit? It's, it's oil. I mean, one and one of them, right. oil. Oil in Hebrew is the word shemen. Shemen, we, we wouldn't know, shemen is linked to the word eight in Hebrew. 
literally. Hmm. Why? Because the power to live in the eighth day is in by living in the Holy Spirit. You break the bounds. You break. You go beyond the end. You you go you go beyond yourself. The power of the eighth day. We can live in 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 the mysteries. It talks about how to live in the eighth day even now. Hmm. You know, one of my producers said that her favorite mystery is the mystery of the bride and the groom. Oh, okay. That, I yeah. mean, you could talk on yeah. that for the next 10 hours. Yeah. But. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, here's the thing. Yeah, one of the most beautiful mysteries, and it's the mystery of the Bible, the mystery of life, it's the mystery of Egypt, and it's this, in a nutshell. The ancient Hebrew marriage holds, the, holds this cosmic revelation. How did it begin? Well, in order for there to be a marriage, the bridegroom always had to make a, a journey from his house to the house of the bride. Always. Then in the house of the bride, he would have to pledge himself. He'd have to give a costly treasure to set her free from her house. And then once they would, they would seal a covenant, drink wine together, cup, then he would go back to his house and he would prepare a home for her. They'd be separated. She'd prepare herself for him. She'd prepare, he'd prepare a home for her. And then the great wedding day would come many, maybe a year later. Great procession. The, the, the bridegroom dressed as a, bra, as a king uh, with, with his men with torches at night coming to the bride. The bride dressed as a queen. He'd come for her. They'd, she'd take off her veil. They'd see each other face to face. He would then, t they'd be carried away in a great procession from her house to the house of the bridegroom where they would celebrate for seven days. What's the mystery? That's the biggest nutshell I could do. What's the mystery here? God is the bridegroom. We are the bride, or everybody watching was born to be the bride. But in order for the mystery to happen, the bridegroom must make the journey. So 2,000 years ago, the bridegroom of our souls journeyed from his house, heaven, to our house, earth. He journeyed to our house. He comes to us and no matter where we are, not just earth, no matter where we are. He's the, he's the God who comes to us. He comes to our door. We have to let him in. And then what did he have to do? In the house of the bride, the bridegroom had to, to produce a price, a, a gift, a costly treasure. To set. Well, he did. It wasn't, it wasn't silver or gold. The, the price was him, his life. That is the bridal gift to set us free. And then they shared a cup. He shared a cup with us. Then, he, then the bridegroom has to return to his father's house. What did he say? I have to go to my father's house. I will prepare a place for you in my father's house or many mansions. I will come again. And so now is the great separation. We are the bride. He's, he's there. We're here. But we are, he, we are to prepare our place, our, to take the time we have now to prepare ourselves for the marriage. We're to become more beautiful. We're getting ready for our eternal home. And then one day comes the second visitation when he will come for us, whether we are alive on that day or whether the end of our life, we're going to have the, he's going to come one more time for the bride and he will come. We will see him then face to face. We will be lifted away with him, the bride and groom, carried on a procession. The old house disappears, the old creation, and we will enter the house of the bridegroom that we have only dreamed about, we've only believed in. We'll see it then, and for the first time in our lives, we will be home. You know, I, I have to just say this. Every Jew understood the Jewish wedding yeah. when these things were penned. And I believe a lot of Jewish people that became believers in the Messiah understood these mysteries yeah, yeah. at that time. In fact, Neander, the great uh, uh, Jewish historian, said at the turn of the first century, there were approximately one million Jewish believers in Jesus. Mm. Uh, Kind of quickly yeah. because it's yeah. but it's so, it's so important much. the Hundreds. divine pluralities. Okay, you would never see this in your English Bible or your Bible. Never. There are so many mysteries that are in the Hebrew, and that is that there are a number of words that you can in Hebrew you cannot say singular, only plural. And I'll give you one one of them. One is the word you know we say God has mercy, but in Hebrew he doesn't have mercy. He has rachamim. Rachamim is not mercy, it's only mercies. He doesn't, in meaning, no matter how, the word for sin, our sins are, is singular, but the word for God's love and mercy is plural. It means that whatever, however much sin we have, there's more mercy and more love to cover it. And I'll just tell you another thing, the word for face, we talk about the face of God. In Hebrew, it's the faces of God. God has many manifestations. Just like many, the names of Yeah, God. like the names of God. And, and you know, and when you, when you talk, about, we talk about Jerusalem, you can't say that in Hebrew. Jerusalem, you, whenever you say Jerusalem, you're saying the two Jerusalems. There's always more. There's a heavenly Jerusalem. Yeah, and right. when you get to heaven, all the plural, I won't go through, I won't reveal it all, but all the pluralities come together in heaven. And the last thing, Elohim, the word for God is plural, meaning there's no end to God. You can never exhaust him. Whatever you think he is, he's better. Here's <laughs> what I want to find out. 
with all of